Welcome to the AI seminar. Today we have Oriol Vignal with us. Oriol is a principal scientist at Google DeepMind and a team lead at the Deep Learning Group within DeepMind. His work focuses on deep learning and artificial intelligence. Before uh, going to DeepMind, he was also part of the Google Brain team and he obtained his PhD in ECS from UC Berkeley and also received his, uh, uh, the MIT Technology Review 35 under 35 in the Winner Award in 2016. His research has been featured multiple times in the New York, New York Times, uh, Financial Times, Wired, BBC, and many others. And his articles have been cited over 70,000 times. He's also been involved uh, in the machine learning community by being the program chair of iClear in 2017 and 2018. And he has also been an area chair of NeurIBS and ICML. I'm very excited of, uh, to have Oriol with, with us today talking about deep learning uh, because his research spans an incredible amount of breadth. Uh, his contributions um, have been in many fields, for example, sequence to sequence, knowledge distillation, and many of the technologies that we see today in Google Translate, text to speech, or speech recognition. But also, he has done an incredible amount of work on also on, on unsupervised learning or self supervised learning, meta learning, and also uh, reinforcement learning. You probably all know about AlphaStar, uh, an AI that reached grandmaster level and that uh, Oriol led the, this project. Uh, so welcome to the AI seminar, Oriol. Uh, for questions, people uh, on the Zoom can just unmute themselves and make the questions. We'll have we can have questions both at the middle and at the end. And for people on the live stream on YouTube, they can write the questions on the chat, and we will have these questions at the end. Welcome to the seminar. Great, excellent. Thank you so much, Farhan, for the invitation. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here at home, um, but talking online to hopefully a diverse set of people uh, around the world. Um, today, it happens to be quite warm in London. It's about 31 Celsius, so maybe it is actually even warmer than it is in Boston, but you tell me at the end. And uh, this talk, you know, I was asked to give kind of a bit of an overview of um, maybe the latest, um, most proven techniques that have been developed in the last few years uh, in deep learning and machine learning really. And um, I will try to give you sort of a glimpse of a few areas. Um, I will go into somewhat detail, but obviously not in a lot of detail given time constraints, but we can have discussions uh, online and hopefully some of the pointers will be useful for further research uh, on your end. But before I begin, the year is indeed 2020, but there have been kind of obviously a few things that have been going on in, in our planet. And I would like to acknowledge this and mention it in kind of how they actually affected the talk in, in several ways. Um, the first, of course, is the COVID situation. So um, I am actually learning a lot about it. I have been trying to think hard about how to apply some of the sequence modeling techniques uh, to it. Nothing too specific to report yet uh, in the talk. But there's been a lot of people in the machine learning community thinking hard about these problems. In fact, yesterday I was in a joint CIFAR Ellis um, kind of talk and, and discussion about, about the issue. Uh, so obviously, that's um, a very important problem that many of us are thinking about. The second is actually the reason why this talk has been moved or pushed back by two weeks um, is because, as you might be aware, there have been quite a few protests and a social movement around Black Lives Matter in, in the US and in, around the world really. And uh, we thought that to support and just be considerate on this cause, um, we would just kind of postpone the talk, which, which is why it, it has been kind of put to a bit later. Um, and another thing I wanted to say is that as part of members of the machine learning community, you know, each of us can think of and do you know, something about to help you know, minorities in our field really, which is, for instance, I, I kind of, um, since there was the New Ribs deadline a few weeks ago, there was a nice initiative that, you know, you could volunteer to mentor people submitting papers to the conference. So I, you know, I signed up for that and sort of, you know, your time, give, trying to give your time to, to those who are in these minorities is at the very least one thing that we can do. So um, I've been sort of trying to think hard how to, also help there. And the last, which is more brief, is that 
a lot of the work I did um, and really many of my colleagues did here were doing um, an H1B visa, which um, you might have heard at least for this year, it's been kind of canceled. So, um, you know, I fully support um, international migration. I was an immigrant to the US for quite a few years. So, um, you know, that's kind of my last point I wanted to raise. Uh, before moving on to um, what the title of the talk is about, which is the deep learning toolbox. So this is obviously a very busy slide um, that I'll, I'll unpack some parts of it during the talk, but I think this kind of spanned from a few of the talks I given this is kind of a summary of all the components that have been developed and further um, advanced in the last few years um, in machine learning. And one of the cool things here is that um, you know, this focuses a lot on architectures and my first part of the talk will be around architectures, but there's been a, a movement lately on losses, which I, I will also describe in the second part of the talk. Uh, but really the motivation is, you know, what, what does it mean? Like what is deep learning really, which is kind of a discussion I really don't want to kind of enter too much into detail, but to me, there are many components that we have built, the research community has built and how to utilize them to solve new problems is kind of at the core of machine learning. So um, without further ado, this is actually a slide. Um, it's not maybe potentially the most pretty slide, but it actually is from my PhD thesis defense. And I think the core of the slide kind of simplifies what the basic machine learning recipe is. So in general, and I'll go into detail through the talk about especially the first and the second parts here, but um, in machine learning, we have some sort of source of data, um, annotated data, uh, although of course reinforcement learning is also part of the equation as I'll explain. And the business we are in is to try to find a mapping or a function that will take some inputs, produce some outputs, and then through the definition of some loss function, um, we will try to fit or learn the parameters of this function. And this is generally done through optimization, um, which obviously is very important as well. But I, in this talk, I will not talk about, although in my thesis, I actually mostly talk about optimization. So this recipe obviously comes um, at the time where there's been also sort of a few, a few revolutions that I'll just mention as they are quite critical. The first of which is the compute scale. And I think uh, Google signifies this kind of neatly. Um, so this is the first kind of Google servers that um, existed as far as I, I, I can tell. Um, they're from like 99, I believe. And you know, google.com was running essentially on these machines. And then you know, as things scaled up in Google, but also in IT, in hardware, um, these data servers become, became a bit more advanced. And today we have, you know, obviously, essentially very large scale deployed um, cloud or like data centers around the globe. And zooming in, another important factor is that um, both hardware also has advanced tremendously. The GPU has been at the core of the revolution in, in deep learning really. And then more, let's say specific um, hardware for machine learning and tensors have been developed as a result of its success. But really the, 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 the thing that fired it all was possibly the GPUs that um, came from, from NVIDIA. So in a way there's been clearly a hardware revolution that we've all kind of witnessed and, and still is ongoing really. There's a very important thing that we need to acknowledge which is software as well, right? So um, back even when I was doing my PhD, few years ago, five to 10 years ago, um, it was not super easy to implement things. Whereas thanks to software that's been luckily also open sourced by many big companies and, and universities alike, um, we now have access to a vast amount of essentially state-of-the-art components to build and mix and match this toolbox that I was mentioning. So, um, you know, the latest and greatest like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Jacks, which I really like, and so on. They're, they're all like kind of helping us researchers really to focus on the core algorithmic components without perhaps paying too much attention to the details on implementation, which helps accelerate progress as well. And last but not least, um, I really like this slide, which shows 
kind of that the true breakthroughs tend to come shortly after a data set and perhaps an evaluation metric or a challenge is defined rather than the actual technological advancement or the algorithmic advancement. Um, so this is kind of an interesting view that, you know, it took convolutional nets many, many years for a data set that was very well created, such as ImageNet, to then produce the breakthrough that we all hopefully heard about. Um, now, there's also a lot of discussion that is very important, and I'm also learning quite a bit in the last uh, few weeks, really, and months, that um, you know, data comes from many sources, and there's a lot of bias and interesting kind of elements just in the data set itself. And obviously, that's not the point of this talk, but it's good to acknowledge that there's a lot of good work being made um, on that category as well. So let's kind of go back to this simplified view of machine learning. And let's try to kind of view a few of these components and what cool advancements um, I wanted to highlight and also tell you a bit in intuitively and almost historically how they were developed um, in the last you know, five years or so. So I started with describing a bit of three pillars that are necessary for the success, current success of machine learning. Um, and I'll devote kind of the two other parts of the talk to talking about the mapping or the function, um, mostly centered around attention pointers and transformers and a little bit on meta learning. I, I thought Chelsea, who just gave a talk last week, would talk about this. I think she talked not so much in, in depth about meta learning, but there's a lot of um, work online as well that you can take a look if you're interested. And then the second part, or really the third, will be about the loss, um, which is something that I'm seeing more and more sort of developments in the last years. Um, and so I'll explain a bit through the same lens of machine learning components, um, what the losses that have been developed and why, and some of the successes that they yielded have been as well in the last few years. Now, before I begin, I wanna give a, a note on prior work. So there are lots and lots of prior work. Um, generally, we tend to rediscover many algorithms that existed even decades ago. And there are quite a few ways in which you could categorize prior work. Um, I'm listing three here. One is the innovation. So, you know, just work that sort of devises an idea that has, wasn't known before. Um, there are also work that shows outstanding empirical results and changes the community by convincing everyone to switch to this or that. And the last but not least, there are very interesting works that um, might not even come in the form of papers, perhaps blog posts and so on, that teach people about something that, you know, the paper, the original paper might not be, you know, doing such a good job at, or even open source or, or, or and so on. So um, in this talk, I'll try to give pointers mostly on B and C. This, this is B and C being second and third. These are slightly easier. And in my personal experience, what, what I learned from something from and so on is, is easier for me to know. Um, but of course, it's very important to recognize like that there's been two inventions and innovation in the last many few de decades. But again, that's not going to be sort of the focus of the talk. So let's begin talking about the mapping, which is perhaps very much related to the slide of the toolbox. Um, I might need to add this, the last component into that slide because that, that slide is a bit old at this point. And what's very cool about machine learning and what's happened in the last few years is that a few years back when you had some feature vector, um, it was already vectorized um, and you, someone thought about features to extract from a modality. And then um, as a machine learning researcher, you had to just feed a function to map this vector, fixed dimensional vector onto an output, classification, logic, whatnot. But what's been very interesting to think about is well, there's the raw modality behind these featureized vectors um, tends to be very dynamic, diverse, not constant length and so on and so forth. So a lot of what's happened in the thinking of making these models work at scale and also work naturally on more and more modalities have been around how do we go from the raw modality to a vector that then you know you would go on to like a deep neural network um, to produce the mapping um, to the outputs, right? So that's really, I think the vectorizing any data structure really is perhaps 
the same problem as to maybe software engineering has been to define the, the you know the key data structures right and that's i think we're not done of course yet with that but there's been a tremendous interest and, and momentum on this so let's use kind of language as, as a very nice segue to to try to understand the issues and desiderata of this vectorization process right so in language modeling or any any anyways in language not really modeling necessarily but it could be classification um, we wish to kind of input into our model like to map x to y we need to sort of at some point have a vector um, of, of neurons if we you want to use neural networks and the main challenge is, well, we have words that come in a sequence. These sequences tend to be variable length. And what we want to do, generally speaking, is try to generate perhaps the probability of the next word, but it could be also a classification task, and map this, this, ob this object, right, this discrete sequence of words, onto a vector h. And this is what the kind of input or the front end of the model really has to do. And thinking hard about for, part, for this particular modality, what do we want this F to do? Well, there are some obvious things such as the order of the words should matter, right? Um, in this case, that's, that's an important property. F should be able to deal naturally with variable length inputs. It would be nice for this F to be learnable so that it can adapt to learning the mapping from inputs to outputs. And it would be even nicer if it was differentiable. Also, for language at least, it's important that individual changes to any input should have a large effect. So it should be a very nonlinear mapping, right? So in this example, uh, modeling word probabilities is really, if instead of modeling word probabilities, I would say something like modeling car probabilities, then you know the H vector should probably change drastically um, what it maps to because that's a very, you know, it's a very different context, even if you only change a single word or added and, an, you know, something that negates the, the meaning and so on and so forth. And then last but not least, since sequences can be large or long, um, we need to be able to preserve long-term dependencies that do exist um, when, you know, we deal with things like books, for instance, that the, what happened in the very first paragraph or very first chapter of course, will have an effect on whatever the author writes on the last chapter. So these are kind of obvious desiderata points. And then already you can think of a few kind of baselines almost that people have come up with, which kind of satisfy some properties, but not all of them, right? So n-gram language models, the order matters. Um, these are just counting sort of sequences of three words and just getting the frequencies and that's your probability distribution, for instance, but then n-grams are basically not variable length. Um, it's not a differentiable process uh, un unless you make it uh, learnable, which is what word back did. And that's, that actually was a huge, huge advance. They actually are powerful pairwise encoding. Um, two pairs of words have very different meaning um, and words are not encoded in isolation. And they don't preserve long long term, right? N grams might go up to five grams, five words. Um, it's already a lot of unique, different sets of sequences of five words, for instance, in English. So you know that's that's not something that n grams can do naturally. Opposed to that, we could just take words, embed the words with word to back, and then just add the words in a sequence. And obviously, for that one, the order is not preserved. So if we permute two words, then the vector that is yielded is the same. And it's not an extremely powerful encoding in that pairs of words, you just sum them. So there's not a lot of interactions that could happen. So to the rescue came recurrent neural networks um, that solved some of these issues. And the core idea, I hope I don't need to explain this in, in great detail, but the core idea of a recurrent neural network was a model that through parameter sharing naturally sort of through neural mechanisms was reading an input one at a time um, linearly mapping to some common space where a linear through the state plus a linear through the new input that is received created a new state and then this is proceed, proceeded forward until you read the whole input sequence and then of course at the output you can do all sorts of different things for instance predicting the next word. 
So RNNs have some good properties, but actually they also have bad properties. They don't encode um, pairwise correlations very nicely. And also they don't preserve long-term, which is a known shortcoming of recurrent neural networks through vanishing gradients problem, if you've heard of that. So RNNs were actually improved upon, although that work was kind of forgotten for, for a few years due to various reasons, um, but it was reserved, reserved first quite drastically, I would say in 2014, which is the LSTM model. So LSTMs were introduced a few years ago and the key insight is to kind of get the best of addition and RNNs, right? So an LSTM is kind of an RNN where instead of replacing the state with a linear layer, you just add to the state. And the equations show that more clearly, but intuitively RNNs introduce, uh, sorry, LSTMs introduce this notion of a forget gate, which lets a sequence that is very long not to be forgotten when there's something that it happened many time steps ago or many words ago. And LSTMs, and to some extent, convolutional models that also have been proposed to model language have kind of added a benefit to preserve long-term dependencies um, and does the name long short-term memory um, that LSTMs have. And with that and, an, and a key innovation that was developed as well um, in 2014 at the time that LSTMs were repopularized, um, called attention, which I'm gonna explain, many applications were unlocked actually um, in language processing. So the key idea that an LSTM still does not get is that it encodes one word at a time, but it, it's, not it's not very natural for it to go back to any position in the input um, sequence and be able to kind of gather information from there. So the, the best way to explain it is with this example. Like, let's assume we want to translate um, you know, from, from Chinese to English, we've encoded perhaps with an LSTM, the input sequence. And now we're about to decode one word at a time, what the translation is. Um, remember, this is all about the mapping, the laws and so on here happens to use the log properties using chain rule, but, um, the mapping itself at decoding time, when you add attention to this model, if you didn't add attention, you would simply take the state here use it here and then start decoding and everything is kind of a long sequence. But what attention did was a very clever idea, which is let's take the encoded sequence, which is variable length and also extract a key vector, right? So there's another linear mapping perhaps that maps every single encoded state to a fixed dimensional vector. And there are a variable number of them in this example, there's seven. And now at in, on the decoder side, we produce for every time step a query queue. Um, assume that the dimensionality of K, the keys and the queries are the same. Um, we can always use a linear layer to map dimensionalities to match. And now the insight is, let's actually just take a similarity or sort, sort, some sort of affinity between the query and the keys. Um, so even a dot product works fine. And the, in this way, we're trying to, the, the query's job is to say wh where in the input, what, not location, but what content. Location is also encoded here because obviously this is a sequential process, but more importantly, what context, what do I want to retrieve at this point in time as decoding goes? Um, and then these affinities tell you kind of where the important stuff of the input is happening. And you can note that this, this strength could be of any position. So it, there's a kind of a, a skip between this point in time um, and any encoded input rather than going through one at a time like an LSTM would need to do. And then there are two options to do here. One, which was the original attention paper, what it proposed is to just read out the answer, so to speak. So let's assume there are also vectors that are value vectors that are similar to the key vectors. Perhaps it's a different linear, although in the original paper, the values and the keys were actually the same vector. And now we can do a weighted sum. It's kind of a readout operation from a memory, if you will, uh, which actually papers like Neural Turing Machine also propose more explicitly as a memory system. And then this weighted sum will aggregate whatever information is needed from the encoded input onto the decoded state so as to produce the right or the correct next word in this translation. Now there's a second option, 
which was developed just shortly after, and it's actually removing one line, if you will, of the original attention, which is to essentially do the same, but don't do the readout. Use these affinities as the object of interest, right? So these affinities, in a way, are pointing to positions in the input. And for instance, this has been used a lot in some text summarization or question answering. When we encode something like who wrote the book, and we have as a context some document that could be quite much longer than this example, um, then you know, what we want to do perhaps is just to copy a few words from the inputs as the answer, right? And then what we need is this pointer mechanism that just picks out the answer instead of reading out and then creating the next new word, right? So these, you know, attention pointers, which actually was mentioned a lot during the New Rips 2019 keynote by Joshua, for instance, are these parts of the toolbox that now are kind of very common. And anytime you have kind of a problem, you can think of how do I use these neural components, if you will, in your problem that would help. So as it happened, then there was a further development that actually removed the LSTMs from this translation paradigm. Um, and this is the paper that introduced the transformer architecture, um, cleverly named attention is all you need. Although I'm sure there's going to be another paper that perhaps says recurrent neural nets are all we need. And this has been kind of a trend in the field that um, things get in and out of fashion um, quite quickly, actually. But let me explain a bit because we kind of know all the components already what the transformers do. So what the transformers really do is instead of at the encoder have this RNN or LSTM that reads one word at a time, what it really simply does is it, it takes the words, the sequence of words, and then it has a self-attention mechanism, right? So instead of attending from the decoder onto the encoder, like I showed before, you just attend from every single word on the, let's say, encoder side to every other word in the encoder. So there are quite a few attention mechanisms here, right? So like for this word that tends to the other N words. And so there's N times N attentions that you need to do. And actually that's been a research topic that has been quite active to make transformers more memory efficient and also faster because they're quite expensive in terms of compute. But the key insight is just to self-attend from all the words in the, in the encoder to create a representation then that will include all the context kind of for free at once. And a very critical component that was added in this paper was what they call positional encodings, which just signals where in the sequence you are because without that transformers are actually invariant to permutations, which is one of the desiderata that I mentioned was important um, in terms of language processing. So putting it all together, the picture is very similar to before, but now instead of having an LSTM reading one word at a time, you really just have a few self-attention blocks encoding the, the, the sentence. And then at the decoding side, you have attention still to the input, the usual attention. And then you generate one word at a time by using as well self-attention on the decoder side. And this just happens to be a more powerful model, sequence model, or really set model actually, as I'll argue in a second that is currently one of the kind of primary objects of interest in this toolbox. And really putting it kind of together, the transformer is sort of the ultimate model. It clearly will not be the ultimate model there. I'm, I'm expecting many new developments on this front, but right now it's one that ticks all the boxes that I could think about. Um, crucially, the order matters one is ticked if you use the positional embedding, but if you actually remove the positional embedding, then you actually have a an encoder of a set, which in itself might be an interesting thing you might do for some other data modalities that are not text related. And the transformer has this very powerful pairwise encoding, which I think is critical for it to achieve the successes that um, I'll describe a bit later in the losses part, actually. So as a fun exercise, and as Farhan mentioned, I, I was involved in this project um, to build a model to play kind of a complicated video game that I actually used to play as a kid called StarCraft. So it's gonna be tricky to make this interactive. So I'm, I'm just maybe gonna go through the exercise um, unless someone will, wants to jump in, but um, I'll just give you like kind of the homework now that you know a few, a few things about these components. 
let's say that I'm, I'm going to be asking you to learn a mapping or a function that goes from a set of units. This game has units that are like these things, right? And this set of units have some, some sort of properties like the type of unit, how much health do they have, um, where are they, um, x, y coordinates, and maybe who owns them? Is it me or is it the opposite player, right? So that, that's, that's the inputs. And then the outputs are interesting, right? This, this is not a classification task, although it can be seen as such if you think of imitating what humans do. But at the output, you must kind of issue orders to these units to perform actions for you, right? And these orders have a very interesting component, which is the subset selection, right? So you might give a very simple command that is move, then move unit one, three, and four to the coordinates 23, 24. And we probably pretty much know or understand how moving is issued. That's just a softmax over sort of types. And then the coordinates are just spatial sort of a convolutional neural network that issues a point in an in a XY coordinate plane. But the object that was very interesting to deal with in this particular project was how do we op out output an, a subset of the whole set of units as the input, right? So there's seven units here. And in this particular example, one of these units is issued the command to you know, do this thing called force field in this XY coordinate. So unless someone wants to tell me how would they go about building these? I'll tell you the answer, but I'll maybe drink a bit of tea to see if someone feels like answering. Good. So the solution um, is actually quite convoluted. And the nice thing is this shows very nicely this toolbox idea that happens over and over, especially in these very large projects that you might have seen um, elsewhere. So. This is actually the architecture that maps the inputs, right? So the inputs being all sorts of different modalities that this game gives you as the input to the outputs, which again are not the trivial like one way, you know, classification over one of out of a thousand classes, right? So this describes like the whole big picture of what the architecture was that 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 played the game did. And you can see many components that are part of this core building blocks, there's a deep LSTM, there's a transformer, there's an attention mechanism, there's a pointer network. Um, but let's go through this particular exercise that I put you to select a subset, right? And I'll explain it to you kind of almost in a tensor way. So hopefully that's a bit technical, but you will hopefully get the, the gist of it, right? So first of all, I said there's a set of entities or units that we must encode. And let's assume that we encode at most 512 units. So it's not really variable length up to infinity. There's a maximum amount of units we will be able to encode. If there are less than 512, we can always pad these. And then these units, let's say, have 30 properties, right? So uh, the input tensor here in the entities is 512 times 30, which are numerical values and all sorts of properties. The very first thing we need to do is encode these, which can be categorical properties and integers and floating points and so on with a linear layer and, and embeddings onto like say 128 dimensional vector. So we now have 512 times 128. And then we apply a transformer. Like remember at this point, these are unit by unit, right? So each position has properties of the unit but not of the whole state of what's happening right now in the game. But once we apply a transformer without the positional embeddings, so crucially, I'm not telling you which position the unit is in because it doesn't matter. This is a set of units. There's no ordering that, that um, should be relevant here. Then we have this transformer output, which is actually the same shape as the input. But critically now at each position, there's an embedding that has crossed information pairwise. Um, and because it's a deep transformer, it did much more than pairwise interactions between all units that are present in this current frame. And that's a very powerful encoder, encoding of the state of the game that's crucial to play very well and to understand fully what's going on. Then we do two things. At the output, we actually sum across the units, right? So we take, for every unit, we take this 128 dimensional vector and we sum it five to half times at most, and we get a single 128 dimensional vector. Now, this is actually permutation invariant, right? If we swap the units in position, the vector we get is exactly the same, which is desirable because, um, as I said, order doesn't matter here. 
And that is kind of summarizing what's going on in the game, right? I mean, am I, am I winning? Am I losing? Should I, should I go and, I don't know, move some units around? Should I build a new base or whatnot, right? So this vector goes into kind of the, the memory component of the architecture. Now, interestingly, let's look at the output. What, how to select a subset of units. So the way to do so is actually fairly simple using a recurrent network on top of pointer networks. And it works as following. Out of the LSTM, through some kind of sampling of what the action type is and so on, we, we get a vector that's, let's say, a query vector at time step zero, um, where we haven't produced a unit yet to issue this command to, so Q0. That's a 128 dimensional vector. And then what, what we do is a pointer network, which is just really a matrix multiplication between these 512 times 128 times this 128 dimensional vector. What this yields is 512 affinities, right? Remember those affinities um, that if we softmax produce a distribution over which un unit should we pick first to issue this action to, right? So that is the first unit. We sample the softmax, then we take the vector that corresponds to the unit we sampled. Um, we take just the, the, the corresponding row of this matrix, which is 128 dimension. We then concatenate this again to the Q0, um, which yields 256 dimension. I, as I said, we then map this back to 128. This is, this is just a detail. And now we have Q1, which is a query for the second unit that we need to output, which is now conditional on which is the first unit that we actually already sampled. And then we repeat this process as many times as we need until a special point in this 512 sequence is pointed at, which might be I'm done selecting units, right? So this is a very powerful, as you can see, like this kind of mixing and matching these components to, do, to produce a pretty a fairly complex object, which is a combinatorial set of all the subset of units that exist in 512. And this would be intractable to do so um, but this is one way in which it becomes actually tractable, right? So hopefully this is an interesting example um, of the attention pointer um, and memory mechanisms that went into this agent. And so um, it also similar to this, for instance, OpenAI did the same for the Dota 2 agent. Oriol, there's a yeah. question by Evan. Yeah. Evan? Oh, okay. Uh, so he cannot turn on the audio, so I will read his question. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Uh, did you all try positional encodings as well and see an empirical decrease in performance? It certainly makes sense in theory that they should uh, not be used for this problem. Yes, so we indeed tried to, um, for, for several reasons, to add a positional encoding to, to kind of signify what each position means, right? So we would have a one code over 512 positions as an extra feature that is the positional encoding. And performance was indeed worse. The reason to do that, though, is that it is there, there's a memory and a persistence in the state, and the ordering actually is not fully random. There's, there's sort of units that appear and disappear in the same positions. So we wanted to see if adding those would be beneficial, but we found no evidence that that was the case. So we kind of quickly moved beyond that. But there are details that matter into, for instance, the unit that I just selected last time step. I, it's important to kind of signify that unit, but that just becomes one of these 30 features perhaps. But it's a very good question. We actually tried and it became worse. It didn't become catastrophically worse, but it definitely was worse. Thanks for I the have, question. I have a related meta question. Yeah. Uh, how do you experiment with these little changes when the overall experiment is so huge? Uh, yeah. it, it's a great point, right? There's, there's a lot, I mean, this talk will not focus too much on the pr practitioner side of things, but I'm very glad you asked the question, right? So. Um, it indeed is very tricky to make these decisions and you yourself feel even confident that you've done the right decision or the right call. I mean, you know, we tried a deeper LSTM here and it improved, but, you know, did we get all the hyperparameters right and so on? I would say the sad answer is that this is kind of part of the kind of the contract you get into when you use these kind of very convoluted models that involve non-convex optimization. Um, there are some practical tips. Um, the one I will give you for this particular instance for this project is that um, there was a lot of components that were, were built for playing the game, such as self-play, um, multi-agent, and, like, and so on and so forth. But to design the architecture, we tried to minimize um, other components' complexities 
And what we did was, was fairly clever, which was just we use supervised learning. So we had a lot of data, which we used to imitate humans, how they play or how they click in, in which units they click based on the inputs. And then we use kind of a supervised loss, which is a stationary and much more pleasant to work with as the sole signal to decide or designing kind of the components and how to mix and match. Obviously, it probably is suboptimal, most certainly. Um, but if you can simplify your problem a little bit to have a clear metric, which for us was on policy, the win rate, it was actually not the likelihood of under the policy, but that's, that's also another design choice. Um, then you should do, do so because indeed it becomes prohibitive to tune this. But at the end of the day, you have to tune things and it is, there's no single answer, but there's a great maybe practitioner's point of view talk that we could give in another time. Sounds Thanks. Good. Cool. Okay. So I'll move on then to the, the last part of the talk, but I will mention like some notable things I will not talk about. Um, maybe the most important of which is graph neural networks. This is a, a great field developing that deals not with sequences or sets, but with this modality of graphs, which is quite important actually to model things even like uh, COVID related issues, because you can think of the graph uh, being kind of how cities are interconnected and so on. Um, there are other interesting avenues like dilated architectures and um, some recent work on particle physics simulation that can be represented kind of with a graph neural net, but the scale or the number of particles and number of time steps makes you feel like there must be kind of a, another way perhaps to encode this data, although we haven't found one yet. So this actually in particular uses graph neural networks. And maybe the last I will describe is the, the most extreme modality that I'll, I'll just mention in passing, I thought Chelsea would give a more extensive talk, is when the data, the X, the input is actually a data set, right? So that's a bit what um, this meta learning paradigm or fuchsia learning does, right? So in meta learning or fuchsia learning, really, um, we need to classify an object onto a category, but we not only need to do that, we need to, at test time, we will be given a new data set or a new support set that will itself define what are the object categories and what is an example of each object category that I will ask you to classify. Um, and this itself is actually um, something that the model needs to map from, right? So in a way, the modality here includes all the modalities that I mentioned and more because it's kind of a, it goes, a, an, an abs, abs, it was one step away from X to Y to actually defining a set, a training set as and trying to encode that um, with a model or a mapping. And this is also where things get a bit diffused um, in the solution space. So again, sadly, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but there's actually, Chelsea has a very nice lecture that I encourage you to read. So one way to do that is actually, and people have used transformers for this, where the, the training set is seen as, a, as an encoded, uh, as the encoder, and then you encode your training set of images and labels, and then at the decoder, you have an image query and then you must produce the right label. So that's what I call model-based approaches to uh, meta-learning. But then another interesting one is one that the function which is parameterized by parameters theta, what you actually change as a function of the set or input S, right, this, is the parameters themselves. So at test time, you actually are doing gradient steps on the loss direction um, to adapt these parameters very quickly to the new classification task. Now, this is a super compressed explanation. Hopefully it's somewhat clear to some of you. I think this is a very exciting and interesting field, but it gives me a segue to actually the other component that I wanted to mention. It will be more brief about today, which is the loss. So the loss is an important object that um, maybe has seen more interest, as I said recently. And let me just go through kind of some of the obvious um, places in which losses define sort of a task, right? So sometimes I will may, maybe mention the task and the loss interchangeably, right? The task is what is the mapping that you want to do from and to, and how will I evaluate how well are you doing this mapping, right? Um, and then, as I said, the component that I will not talk about is optimization. So the obvious kind of first loss that everyone kind of in, in machine learning 101 hopefully learns about is supervised learning in which the data is pairs of input outputs, um, you know, images and categories or, or what have you, regression tasks, there's all sorts of examples. And then 
the model can be any of the things that I mentioned before and more. I mean, convolutional networks, there's lots of models that are more vanilla that I haven't explained. And then you define a loss that essentially tries to measure the distance or the divergence between what you produce and then the label that was given to you as part of the data. And that's what essentially supervised learning is in the kind of super bird's eye view. There are many references and tutorials. It was kind of hard to find one that I was worthy mentioned, but you know, Google it, I guess. And many examples exist of successes. ImageNet is, is kind of the, the one that everyone uses where the error rates have been dropping a lot. This, this light, um, I guess was not updated in for the last few years, but it really has been staggering how much um, this performance has been in, improving thanks to sort of all sorts of details, like practitioner details actually that matter a lot. Um, and also some key innovations such as ResNets and um, you know data augmentation dropouts and so on. And the other one that hopefully you get to experience pleasantly um, although I've discovered a few false positives lately is, you know, spam classification. That's actually probably the one that was shown as the classical example before ImageNet became so popular. Another kind of classic supervised task, which actually involves language, which, which is obviously given an email, is it spam or not, right? So that's, that's very important um, for us not to kind of lose productivity to read. And a spam obviously decreases as a function of this becoming also critical. Now, the second example, again, bird's eye view it's, it's an important one to mention is sequence modeling and it's a bit different because because in sequence modeling there's there could be a target then it becomes supervised learning but sequence modeling in itself is there's no target except that parts of the sequence become your target right so in language modeling um, you just observe language that's why it's unclear whether it's supervised or unsupervised learning but you observe a bunch of language and then you make a task to predict future words given the current set of words, right? So in this case, there's no label, but your task is to essentially maximize some probability, maybe measure on the data set you have, um, which could be done with recurrent neural nets. But of course, you could use, you know, GANs, VAEs. There's all sorts of different models here that you can plug in. And sequence modeling has been obviously quite important. Translation is an example which actually involves supervision in a way because there's a pair of sequences, an input sequence and a target sequence. Um, but we discussed this at extents when I was describing attention models. And the other one, more recent ones you've seen is on just pure language modeling, which uh, recently OpenAI has been doing great, a great work at kind of exploring the limits of scaling up these models and the notion of just maximizing log probability of a lot of data has yielded some interesting results in zero shot actually, and, and so on, um, which I encourage you to read about is, I find these results very fascinating. Um, so, um, so now let, let's enter into some like more interesting domains. So, so reinforcement learning, right? We were in this like, okay, we have X, Y pairs, or maybe only X as a sequence um, as the object or the data that we're given. In reinforcement learning, the data is actually the environment Right, so there is some environment, let's say StarCraft, the video game, or Atari or Go, and this environment is is sort of a data set in a way, right? Because if you interact with this environment, then trajectories can be created, right? Which which are sequences of observations and actions um, that then you kind of do some learning on top, and that's basically the, the core of reinforcement learning. On top of that, there also it's possible to sometimes, if you're lucky, get extra data from people or trajectories that exist. For instance, in imitation learning, we might actually just observe a bunch of people playing the game. We don't need to know exactly how the environment works. We just observe sequences of states and actions, and that can be very beneficial, right? So sometimes you're given explicitly a data set as well, kind of a supervised data set of these pairs. But in the pure reinforcement learning setting, the only data is the environment. And then you generate your own data by defining a model that maps from state to action and then interacting with this environment. And the environment also defines a reward, which generally um, you can then train a variety of losses. And again, I'm not going to go extensively onto a reinforcement learning tutorial. There are quite a few of those recent, but actually Dave's one from 2015 is actually quite good. 
um, as well. So I would recommend checking that out maybe as a maybe older version of, um, but very well explained concepts about losses that people in, in reinforcement learning have been doing, such as Q learning, where the goal here is to try to predict what's going to be the eventual accumulative reward over the whole trajectory that you've just been playing on, um, or maybe actor critic methods, which involve also learning the Q function, but also directly parameterizing the policy as a neural network, right? And there's quite a few um, different losses that have been proposed beyond this, but you know, the reinforcement problem setting defines the data and then the task and the losses slightly differently than supervised learning and sequence modeling. But in a way, there are also quite a few relationships, obviously the, the paradigm or it fits kind of in, in these data model loss and optimization categories. Optimization generally tends to be pretty constant across all these when part of the model is a neural network. Usually you use some form of Adagrad, Adam, or SGD um, as an optimizer. And there's a few successes. Um, you know, you probably have seen Chelsea's talk last week um, in robotics. I think this is an image from, from her lab or her former lab rather um, in, in Berkeley. Um, and then of course, you might, I mean, deep reinforcement learning was kind of popularized in the famous like Atari paper from DeepMind. That's how I got to actually know about DeepMind as well myself in, in a, in a new uh, deep learning workshop. Um, Go, open like OpenAI 5, uh, Dota 2, or the StarCraft um, work that I just mentioned are kind of other examples of scaling up this idea of reinforcement learning. Notably, a lot of the successes have been in kind of virtual environments. Um, I put robotics here because that's a notable exception, but that's perhaps one of the things that I would like or I would expect to see more reinforcement learning progress on. Now, almost reaching the end, but another interesting concept that has proven very useful in, in, in many of these applications um, as part of the laws is this idea of distilling um, knowledge from one model to another. So this one is rather simple. Um, and I think this picture summarizes it all. Um, the data here is data, again, like images, let's say, and then a function that you might have trained in some other way, right? So you have a teacher that is a neural net that's been trained and given to you. And that's what generates sort of your task or loss. And then it's almost the same as supervised learning, but instead of using the labels that are given to you by the Oracle, whoever labeled the data set, in this case, we're trying to mimic or match the teacher neural network or other function approximator algorithm. Um, and this yields some surprising results. The one that I kind of found more interesting and more recent is the one that I actually achieved state of the art ImageNet, probably not true anymore, but it was state of the art at the time, which used this idea of noisy student training, which um, kind of uses the notion of training a model and then using a lot more data um, to then label, um, label uh, through this process of using the teacher as labels. And then that actually yields some impressive performance on ImageNet. So the last but not least, because that's very kind of uh, a very kind of interesting research topic, very active, is what people tend to now call self-supervised learning. And in this paradigm, self-supervised learning actually comprises again a data, right? The data set of images or text or speech or whatnot. And then the other component that, that has to be specified is a task. And the task is actually specified by researchers, right? There's 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 ways to automate this task and there's some work on that, but most of the successes is someone thinking hard about what task or self task could I think about to do in this modality so as to yield some interesting representations of these data. So I have two examples of this and then I'm just going to give some summary or conclusions of the talk. The first is what I call contrastive losses. A few examples of these from the early days um, in noise contrastive estimation um, to the most recent SimClear models and beyond. And the idea is very neatly summarized in this picture, right? The task specification that people have come up with in especially vision to create good representations from which you can train very efficiently a, a, a linear classifier to do ImageNet is simply to take an image augment it randomly two times, let's say, and then passing it through a deep model 
and at the top try to make the representation from the same original image which you know which one it is because you just created this um these labels yourself so these two should be close to each other whereas across images that are not the same you don't know the label of the image you just know that they're not the same image they should be repelled and this is formally expressed as this loss there are some tricks to compute this loss that i'll not go into too much detail um, which is the sum over all the x primes this is too expensive so that's you just sample a few negative examples but the idea is maximize agreement between the same image augmented in different you know instances of the augmentation and then maximize this whilst minimizing the distance to everything else. So this is a very interesting topic, lots of progress and state of the art, even surpassing at some point supervised learning itself by just doing this unsupervisedly. And then the last but not least is BERT, where in BERT, the task specification, right? So it's nice, it's the same framework, it's just what is the task? So in BERT, the task very creatively is as follows. You take a sentence, you randomly mask some words of the inputs, and whichever words you have masked, you use these as target outputs. And your job is to predict each of the words you mask at the input that you don't see. So otherwise you would be able to cheat and predict them at the output. And formally that's the laws. And I mean, an example would be, there's this sentence, I blank from blank. And then the laws would be in this case, predicting am in the second word and you know Barcelona, which is the sentence, a sentence I could write uh, on, the, on the second term of the loss. And then you do this over and over and the representations learned actually are quite useful and have revolutionized natural language processing. So with that, I've kind of give you a, a broad overview of the deep learning toolbox focused not only on function approximators, which is what this slide mostly is about, but also losses and tasks. And I'll just conclude with a few, in my opinion, open problems, there are many more, um, but I want to highlight a few, right? So in the function approximation realm, um, I think going to larger sets or sequences is still challenging. If I give you a graph of a million objects, which is very common in some computer science applications, it's just too expensive to even do inference, not to mention learn on, on this sort of data, right? So there's, there's a challenge there for the community Another one, which I think is interesting is once you've trained, you've trained this model, barring some exceptions, it's very hard to adapt this model to, to a new sort of paradigm or maybe fine tuning it to another task. It's, it's very like the parameters are very so much into this local optima that it's very fiddly to do this. Meta learning tries to, to solve this, but I think there's lots of progress to be had in sort of having these models truly adapt um, fast to new conditions. And on the loss side, I think the, the most interesting problem that was exposed to me thanks to reinforcement learning was non-stationary losses. I think these are very interesting. When you generate your own data, like in reinforcement learning, the loss keeps changing. And I think that is very interesting. It also happens a bit in self-supervised learning, actually. Overall, you want losses that are easy to optimize, um, you know, make, make your models more data efficient and st stable. You want quality of life for the practitioner's side point. And this generally is not always the case. And you need to know the tricks, how to initialize things and so on. And part of the reason why this is the case is the loss might not have been the most easy to deal with from the optimizer side point. And last, but very important, in architectures, I think we've done great at mixing and match, matching these components. I think I've shown you a few examples on, of how to do that. But once it comes to losses, it's really tricky how to do that, right? So if you have a loss on imitating a teacher from a distillation standpoint, but at the same time you have some labels and maybe you have a self-supervised loss for consistency, you have all these losses. You wanna kind of add them up and you need to know how to add them up together to do well on some tasks that you might care about. It's very tricky to even theoretically think about how to mix and match or sum losses together. So I think that is a huge topic to discover. And in reinforcement learning, for instance, this is called the exploration exploitation sort of dilemma um, because these are two losses that kind of contradict each other. So this is, this is also lots of progress I hope to be had here. So with that, I'm open to stay for a while for questions. I want to acknowledge um, a lot of people who have provided or looked through the slides. Um, but yeah, it was great to be here in my home giving a talk to hopefully many of you. 
And I'm obviously always happy to be reached out through um, you know, social media or elsewhere to discuss you know, further in detail, maybe some of the topics that I covered only superficially. But yeah, let's open for maybe some more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oriol, for a great talk. Uh, so if you're on Zoom, you can just unmute yourself or if someone else is talking, you can raise your hand. And similarly, if you're on YouTube, you can just write a comment. Um, so if there are some questions. Hi, thank Hi. you for the talk, Ariel. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the role of uncertainty estimation in deep learning? This is something you didn't touch so yeah, much yeah. or at yeah. all. Yeah, I, so, I love this topic actually. So yeah. yeah, uncertainty is maybe a topic that needs potentially a benchmark so that we can start really ta tackling it, right? So the a main problem that we see kind of in an exaggerated way almost in, for instance, adversarial examples is that neural networks can be very confident and there's almost no reasonable data set which tries to understand when a neural network should tell us, look, this input you've given me, this X, I'm just not gonna map it or I shouldn't map this because this X is not part of what I know what, you know, I, I, I cannot have a like, a good prediction from this. It's a very important topic, of course, with lots of implications. And I really like it. I think it probably can be, um, it's part of the task definition that um, would need to, you know, people, the community would need to really come up with a task such as ImageNet happened that people would accept as, oh, this is a great benchmark for, you know, uncertainty research and, and you know, then hopefully work on it. But I really like this topic. Indeed, I did not, not touch upon it, but um, lots of work to do actually in the modeling side as well, because then you would need a class saying none of the above, right? I mean, I, 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 we don't even kind of add this class generally in, in ImageNet. I mean, if you pass a class that's not part of ImageNet, the model has no way to tell you that, right? So it's very interesting. Thanks for the question. There is another question on the chat by Evan. So I'll just read it. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for a great talk. You've done a lot of work in a wide range of fields, how do you stay up to date with state-of-the-art methods in all areas you work in? Do you rely on survey papers or focus on conference papers or read good blogs or something else? Yeah, that's that's a great. I mean, uh, yeah, talking about how how to keep how to keep up to date. Um, I mean, there there are several methods. Um, I use I use a mix a mix of of things as probably everyone uses. I obviously change as well over the years and the field has changed as well in how work is presented. Um, social media wasn't a thing. And right now, I guess I don't even put my name. I put my handle because that's kind of the easiest on how to keep up to date with what I'm doing and so on, right? But I think um, I rely a lot on my colleagues actually, right? So as, as, as I kind of have worked on a few topics and then, you know, sometimes I, I just kind of, oh, I want to learn something new, like reinforcement learning, right? So then I, I have to kind of not, I, I don't have so much good grasp of what might be happening in natural language processing. Then I need to rely on colleagues. And, you know, this happens both internally from people that happen to be working where I work, right? Where they just communicate and papers that are significant, right? And so on. And then other methods or platforms such as, um, conferences, which is a great way to expose. I, I always go through poster sessions, trying to kind of go through all of them at least take a look at the title and see if something sparks like um, interest and so on. Um, but what's what's problematic is there are so many papers that, you know, picking what which ones are going to pass the test of time. There's some papers that, um, and you know, I'm guilty of this, even the authors, I mean, work on something, but it's not something they, they themselves will, will keep using or researching on. So it's good to focus on some papers that will clearly be changing, field changing in the future and predicting those. That takes maybe yeah, some, someone that can advise you with that or just taking a look or, or asking around and whatnot. Um, and then obviously there are some great papers that also go under the radar and those are much harder to kind of um, come along nowadays because there are quite a few papers um, which, is, which is kind of a trend we've seen in the last few years, right? Um, but yeah, I use, I definitely use a mixture, but usually like colleagues that are experts in the field or that might be more plugged into what topics are of my interest are, is, is a way to keep up. 
Um, sometimes it's it's okay also not to read too many papers, not just to kind of try to be creative, right? So have a time of like thinking what are the real problems, um, and then many times someone has done it, which is great actually. Like sometimes people say, oh, if I have an idea and if there's a paper very with very good empirical evidence, uh, good theory, and so on, then you know that's actually good news in general. I think in a field like ours. Uh, Neil, you have a question. Yeah, I was wondering if you could discuss a little bit how you make sure that your models don't become computationally excessive in their demands and sort of what are the most common trade-offs that you see and how do you make them? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think the trend, I mean, obviously there, there's a bit of a selection process that the most expensive or in, you know, insanely computationally unfit for like GPUs and TPU models just don't, are not picked up by anyone because they are not tractable. So there's a bit of natural selection of sorts of, of the things that get published naturally feed the hardware. And actually that yields a very interesting question about hardware versus models, like which, you know, many times I am asked like, oh, what's the next generation models that, you know, our hardware should support. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fun game to play because you don't quite know, but given some hardware, you can innovate in the model space in some interesting ways and vice versa, right? So I would say hardware in a way dictates a lot what models tend to, um, be feasible and because of the amount, sheer amount of training you need to go through in general for most of the things I've discussed, um, in inference, right, when you have the model trained already, um, inference time tends to actually be surprisingly low for, for most of the models you see, right? So training takes a lot, a, lot, a long time. And maybe thanks to that fact that so far training usually takes, you know, weeks um, for the largest models that you see around. Um, these models actually deploying them you in in a few milliseconds or and so on you can do inference for instance the one that plays starcraft is a 30 millisecond inference model it mm -hmm. took a while to train but once it's trained it has all these components but it's actually fairly straightforward to go from the input to the output once the parameters are there right so um, i think there's a bit of lucky that training is so expensive that may, means that models at deployment time especially are not so expensive, but training time is indeed a problem. And there's this interesting tension between hardware and models that, um, I mean, it's super interesting. And there's, there's, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people discussing this. I myself, again, have been involved in some of these discussions and they become quite fun because you kind of have to guess the future three years ahead because of course, hardware is designed far in advance. And it's, it's actually like, I mean, yeah, it, it's fascinating actually. But yeah, great question. But in general, I think natural selection um, through successes because of the scale at which things have to be trained for uh, as long as they have tend to make us be constrained to the space of models that at least an inference time are pre pretty tractable. Thanks. Shab, you have a question? Yeah, so my question, I mean, first of all, thanks for covering the breadth of topics, really interesting. Uh, in terms of choices you have between like architectures and losses, do you see any stark differences between your go-to model choices when you're considering, let's say, more of a game game playing style problems versus like real world tasks like search or recommendation tasks, which are more about user interaction type data. Yeah, I mean, there's there's really like at the end of the day, right? Like there's there's I mean, there's a lot of discussion about well, inductive biases that you you need your model to have, and and you know it's not all like you know really like raw modality, and and although transformers start to get close to something that operates at the bias level. And, and you almost don't need to think about too much what the underlying data is, but this is still kind of aspirationally. Um, what I usually do um, in practice when there's a new problem, um, and, and so you, you, you understand what the loss is, what the task is, what the input and the outputs kind of specifications are, I tend to basically focus on a model that is actually as simple as it can be, but it also makes no assumptions that are not real, right? So for instance, um, I, for, for a while, I don't think I've made, you know, I, I've made independent assumptions, right? So if, if I think that predicting this action should depend on the previous action, I will definitely ensure my model is capable of representing these to some extent, right? So um, think of all the requirements for correctness that your model needs to have find the minimal set of components that you need to plug in. I mean, okay, I need memory. So, okay, I'm going to add, you know, whatever, a transformer or an LSTM. I need, I need to deal with graph that need to be permutation invariant. So, you know, you can think of all the requirements 
try to find the minimal way to combine them. Um, and then from there on, there's the kind of experimenting part, which I mean, it is indeed like a bit of an art actually, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's part of, part, part of the deal, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, that at least is one principle that I always try to apply. If someone tells me, oh, let's try this thing, which actually is incorrect from the get go, I tend to try to not, you know, try that. I mean, you need to do these baselines eventually, but, um, but to design the solution, I, I, I'd like to think of correctness as, as maybe the one um, element that um, from which to start from. Cool, not sure if there's more questions in the chat. Actually, I have not seen anything. So. Uh, so at the beginning of your talk, you were mentioning how pointer, network, for pointer networks, for example, make kind of these choices on, on words, or for example, you also use them uh, to kind of compute convex calls or traveling yeah. and problem in, in some of your work. Um, I guess these choices are combinatorial, yet we are training the network uh, via gradient descent. I was wondering if you had any intuition on why this works at all, and if sometimes it fails, and uh, yeah, why? Yeah, yeah. It, is this your question or someone else's? It, it's my question. Okay, okay. I, I like this question. I mean, it, it's, I think it's quite fascinating. Um, there, there, there's kind of a whole subfield that, again, I haven't mentioned, but um, there's actually quite, there's some activity in my team actually working on, you know, the intersection of combinatorial optimization and then like kind of deep learning or reinforcement learning. Um, there's quite a few examples of these. I think um, it's fascinating to think about sort of solving these combinatorial problems where you, you know that the discrete loss surface looks extremely non-convex and sort of hard to optimize. And then there's kind of this alternative view, which is, well, let's just use a policy that in some form parameterizes this combinatorial space, maybe via the chain rule and outer reg regressive models, right? So that's kind of what you tend to see, or like we let, let's parameterize choosing one out of n. You do it, you know, a few times, and now you have a combinatorial output space. And then optimizing now, changing the optimization from discrete to let's say using either supervision or reinforcement learning, where you would sample solutions and then backpropagate through the actions which are discrete onto the parameters that are continuous. And why would that work? I mean, that's fascinating. I think. Theory-wise, there are quite a few interesting results that I'm not sadly super familiar with, but in practice, there's more and more being done in this space. There, there's, there's now quite a few actually workshops, um, one of which actually is hopefully happening in LA in, in 2021 by IPAM is, is a, a workshop that happens every year. And, and that's gonna focus this year on combinatorial optimization and machine learning. So yeah, I find it fascinating um, it, feel, it feels like it cannot be the case that you, you, you can change the problem and suddenly it becomes a bit more tractable. And it's not convex, of course, but it, 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 it seems like things converge a bit faster. But on the other hand, those methods that, use, that optimize discrete choices have a lot of heuristics built in. So maybe learned heuristics will be better than hard-coded heuristics, which is something that as a machine learning prediction, I, I could definitely buy more into. But fundamentally, there must be like a no kind of no free lunch theorem here as well, for sure. But it's super cool. I, I, yeah, fascinating topic as well. Thanks. Uh, there is one um, more question on YouTube. Uh, so, okay. Daupadas uh, asks, what is the importance of the choice of positional encodings for transformers? And would it be a problem for uh, long sequences? Yeah, so positional encodings are. Um, there's a few variants that, that in the paper, the original transformer paper they study such as sinusoid, cosine, cosine and or like absolute positions and whatnot. Um, to me, it feels like it is a solution that kind of works for the length of sequences that we're currently operating at um, in transformers. Um, maybe a few hundred tokens, potentially we, we're seeing like up to a thousand and so on. But I do agree that in general, um, if, we, if we're trying to, let's say, encode a full book and answer some very complicated questions about it, um, it's not going to be possible to have, you know, 100,000 words, like let's say a book that's 100,000 words long and be able to encode it where we have these sinusoid, cosinusoid signals 
that are now going to be minuscule because each word is there's so many words that you don't have enough kind of dimensionality there. Um, that being said, there are quite a few alternatives that are starting to be proposed, um, which go more on the hierarchical, you know, hierarchical um, architectures that would kind of build for a short sequence where I think positional embeddings would work. Um, and then they compress that onto a single memory and so on and so forth, right? So there's some good work. Um, the only one that, that sadly comes to mind is from, from uh, Jack Ray in, in DeepMind, which is called Compressive Transformers. It's, it's an elegant model, but there's quite a few others. Um, the reformer actually also uses k-means actually. So, so, so there are ways in which probably we'll, we'll, we'll see a combination between positional embeddings, but then hierarchical encoding when the data starts to be as large as I was mentioning in the last slide, uh, like tens of thousands of tokens or more. Okay, so we'll make one last question uh, from, and then since it's already pretty late, we'll close the session. Chuck? Yeah, um, so I, I'd be curious to hear, like, what's your take on how, how far we are in terms of advancements, in terms of differentiable operators? So, I mean, uh, as we venture into these, like, set style problems, like set transformers mm -hmm. being an example. So, I mean, the moment we start attack access to some of these uh, ranking or sorting operators or mm -hmm. diversification operators. So I'm just curious, like what comes to your mind when you think how far we are in, in, the, in that? Aspect? Yeah, I think, I think we're, we're, yeah, we're not very far at all. I would say that there's, there's, we, we need, we need maybe, as I said, for the, for the very interesting topic of um, uncertainty, we probably need, a well-established benchmark that would, you know, that would be regard regarding more like these discrete objects and whatnot, right? One that people would be excited to work on for for a few years, and and but right now, you know, there's there's only like modest steps to being able to even conceivably map onto those spaces, but then probably we're using absolutely the wrong optimizers, um, you know, using kind of Hessian estimates and whatnot. Um, that that Adam, for instance, uses, and so it's it's we we yeah we are probably at its infancy, right? It's it's you know things can happen quickly though in the field. I mean the the you know in 2014, um, you know having a sequence was the most annoying thing in deep learning, right? You you wouldn't you know you need to oh take a few things and window them and so on, and that was kind of more of an opportunity actually, um, and things kind of evolved quite quickly. I don't think sequences is a, is a soft topic at all, but you know, like that's, you know, the same way that advancements happen there quickly, there could happen here, but, um, but yeah, I don't see, yeah, I cannot point to a kind of a single breakthrough or even like a very well-defined data set that would make me believe, oh, that that's so well-defined now progress will definitely happen. Um, like, like, you know, it was maybe pre-announced with the creation of ImageNet. These are great questions. I mean, I would stay here. I mean, as you can see, there's a still light in London. It's like sunsets <laughs> like at 9.30 or like it's it's, um, uh, it's summer summertime, I guess, indoors is summertime. But um, but yeah, the, the questions are great. I mean, again, feel free to reach out to me with more thoughts or even feedback on the talk. I I would, you know, I would love to hear from, from more of you. I mean, sorry that I guess we don't have time, I guess, for more questions, but yeah. Thanks, Riel, for a great talk and for answering all our questions. Um, the rest of you, uh, see you next week. We have a talk by Shimon Whitesun about multi-agent RL. Thanks all for coming. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.